Can someone give me a verbal indication that you can see my slideshow? Yeah, we can see, I can see your slideshow. All right, sweet. Looks great. Okay, so um, I'm gonna do my best to not keep everybody too late. Um, our goal right now is to go over a little bit of the electrical design checklist, which is a super critical document and like people understanding what all the checks are and how to use them and being motivated to use the checklist is super critical for our team's success. And that's why we're going over it um, with everybody today. And so I'm um, gonna give you a little bit of context about what it is, and then we'll talk about um, some of the lines. And hopefully, if we have time, I don't wanna give everybody too late, but I'm hoping we can do um, kind of an interactive session uh, going through the design checklist. And because we have a small number of people, that's actually gonna be kind of nice because you can get some one-on-one -on -one intention from an electrical lead probably, um, or maybe one-on-two, something like that. Okay, so what is the design checklist? I'm actually gonna get out of the presentation really quick um, and show you the old checklist from when I was a sophomore. This is what it used to look like. You might've seen the one from this year if your sub-team lead went through it with you um, when they were presenting. Oh, sorry, when they, um, sorry, not presenting, when they were. <laughs> Uh, checking your, PC, your PCB or your schematic or your layout or something. Um, and it was basically a list of like just things we had made mistakes on in the past or like reminders about what you had to do. And so like one of them, for example, is like do the design rule check. So you know the little ladybug thing in KiCad that checks the design rules? We would forget to do that all the time in the past. And so like we just had to write down, make sure you do this. Otherwise we would forget to do it. Um, and so the other things like fix pin three on buck converter, that's like on the template schematic I made that year, I messed up pin three, it was connected to the wrong thing. So then on every schematic, we had to double check that. And so we still kind of use it that way um, nowadays. You know, we have things on there like, I don't know if you remember, but on the template schematic, we had the wrong current limiting resistor on the 12 volt LED. Um, and so we had to make sure we switched that on everybody's schematic. So we still kind of use it that way, but because of the way it looks now, um, and you'll see it when we practice, I'm not gonna show you right now, but like it's got a lot more structure. It goes in like a chronological order. It's somewhere between like, you could use it as a guide as you're designing a PCB or a schematic um, for things you should be thinking about. And, but we also wanna use it as a design review tool. And so I'm gonna be talking about it mainly from the design re review tool aspect, but you could use it as a guide. And some feedback I got from my sub team this year is it would have been super helpful to see the PCB design checklist before they had made their schematics and layout so they kind of see it as they're doing it instead of just afterwards me telling them all the things that you know they didn't do that were on the checklist so that's something we can all think about in the future is kind of strategy for applying this um, when we're teaching people so one thing i want to talk about is what the mindset of someone of you, you what mindset you should be in when you're using this checklist to review someone else's work so in this case someone else tonight that'll be adi for us has designed something and they come to you and they're like, hey, can you review my design? Because I want to get it shipped out. And reviewing designs is super critical. That's why we have design reviews. Um, but it's super critical to review them in this level of detail as well um, and catch all the minute things because it's super easy to make mistakes when you're designing electrical um, circuits and PCBs. And so you want to have this mindset of trust but verify. Because it's you want like you want to trust that everyone's a good engineer and they're doing their like honest best effort to do a good job but it's super easy to misread data sheets. We've all done it many times. You could have had a design change that maybe someone didn't consider, or you know about a design change that they didn't know about. They might be using a new component. When you use, when you use a new component, there are so many mistakes you can make. Having the wrong footprint, having this right footprint, but the wrong variant of that footprint with a different pinout, um, having a very similar footprint, but with different pitch, having um, you know, any number of things that you might make a mistake on when the first time you're using a new component. And so, there are many times when people are gonna make mistakes. It's just gonna happen. And that's why we have this super detailed, like over 80 line checklist um, of things you need to consider. So the other problem though is you don't have infinite time to do these reviews often, especially if you're like in, a, in like a position where you have to review a few people's PCBs for a tight timeline or something. So you're gonna make a lot of calculated risks as you're doing this and you'll develop an intuition over time for like which checks are more important than other checks. Um, so you might think about things like who made the design choice? Has it been tested before? Like for example, the buck converter, we know we've tested it, we know it works. So if we see a buck converter layout on a schematic that looks exactly like the template one, then we don't even think about reviewing it because we already know that it's gonna work. Um, you might think, and like all these things, you're gonna think about how much time you have 
And you might think about like, how likely is it to impede proper operation? So example, for example, a current limiting resistor, not that hard to change if you put the wrong one on your PCB, right? We can pop it off and put a new one on. Even if you ruin the LED, we can pop it off and put a new one on. But if you messed up the traces between your microcontroller and um, the CAN transceiver, for example, that's gonna be a lot of rework. The rework is probably gonna make it work, um, not work as well as if the traces work properly. So, and in some cases, the rework might be impossible. So you'll kind of get into it for like what things are super critical to check. A disclaimer about this presentation is it's not a scientific paper. I'm gonna use a lot of graphs and numbers, but they're just kind of general estimates for these things. Um, they're based on real components, but they're like sort of estimates of the different graphs and numbers you'll see. The point is to have it good enough to kind of get the job done and build some intuition. So, um, yeah. All right. Originally, we were going to try. We were going to try and cover power management and microcontrollers tonight, and it became apparent that that was way too much. And then it became apparent that even power management alone was too much, and it actually became abundantly obvious that like to really do do the design checklist justice we are only going to be able to cover one line tonight, which is over voltage protection with Zener diodes. So if you already know everything about over voltage protection with Zener diodes, I'm sorry, this will be a very redundant presentation for you, but I hope even people who already know the concept of this will get something out of the detail that this presentation goes into about it. And the detail is really important. And the point I'm trying to get across with the detail is that each of these items on the design checklist, you should be, understanding and scrutinizing to the level of detail this presentation goes into and if you determine that there's something wrong with them you should update them and change them um, and so that's why we're going to go into such heavy detail on this one line all right so i'm gonna do a quick poll because you know everyone knows i love polls and that poll is going to be god what happened to my aunt okay well the answer is already up that wasn't supposed to happen that was weird. Did I just click too many times? Okay, whatever. Well, I took the answer away, so we'll just do the poll <laughs> really quick. I don't know if everybody saw the answer, but um, it's important to kind of get a sense for what um, things are gonna be under any given category. Can people see the poll? Can anyone yes. hear me? Oh, okay, cool. Okay, so, um, the point is that with these different categories, it's important to start develop like an understanding of which things are in which category. So I just want to give a sense of what people think might be under the category of power management. So I got one response. You can just guess. If you don't know, just give your best guess. What kind of things might be under the category of power management? I guess I'll give it another 30 seconds or so here to see if people get a chance to respond. If you get it wrong, it's totally fine. I'm not gonna share the results anyway, and it's anonymous, so it doesn't even matter. This is just, the point I'm trying to get across is like, as a reviewer, you're, you have to kind of, if you understand what things might be under a category, you can find them on a schematic much more quickly. Um, for example, when you're looking for power management. Okay, so I got like six responses, so that's pretty good. I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling. Um, so the correct answer here, um, is uh, the buck converter, bypass capacitors, and linear voltage regulators. And so when you're in the power management category, your mind should gravitate towards those type of components, things that are converting a voltage, things that are supplying current, like bypass capacitors, linear voltage regulators, buck converters are converting some voltage down and supplying, a lot, supplying power. So those are the kind of things you should think of when you're thinking about power management. All right. So we're just gonna talk about over, over voltage protection today. So the over voltage protection we have in our schematics is in the form of the Zener diode. This Zener diode is in reverse bias. And we're gonna understand in a lot of detail now why that provides over voltage protection to our circuits. So to understand over voltage protection with a Zener diode, you have to be really comfortable with um, a lot of current voltage plots. You can also do this in a purely mathematical way, but I'm gonna be talking about it from a graphical like current voltage plot perspective right now. Um, and so that's why we're gonna go into them in so much detail. The resistor we're just gonna cover to make sure we're all comfortable with the idea of a current voltage plot. But then the ones that are gonna be important to us are power supply and battery because that's how we get power 
And so this is what we need to protect from when we accidentally um, have the voltages of these things too high. And then we're going to talk about ideal diodes and then the real diode, which is going to be the Zener diode. We're not going to talk about the difference between Zener diodes and other diodes today, um, just because that's a little too much content. But um, basically, all diode curves look roughly the same, just with some shift in, um, you know, along the x-axis or wider or something like that. Okay. Um, we're also going to talk about an ideal voltage source in between these two. I forgot to put it here, but it's just going to be a, help us understand how a power supply works. Okay. So this is the current voltage plot for a resistor. And so basically, um, if you imagine having a resistor and there's no voltage across it, there's gonna be no current flowing through it. So it's gonna be at this, this center point, the origin, zero, zero. There's gonna be zero voltage across it, zero current flowing through it. As you increase the voltage across it, the current through it will linearly increase because of this equation that defines how a, current, how a, vol a resistor operates, uh, which is vehicle, vehicles IR, Ohm's law. And so the, recipro the reciprocal of the resistance is going to be the slope of this. And so any voltage you apply across a resistor, whether it's negative, positive, whatever, the corresponding current is going to put that operation exactly somewhere on this purple line. So when you see a current voltage plot, you should know that the component it's for, it will never operate anywhere in any of the white space. It'll always be exactly on the purple line. Um, they don't have to be purple, but in this presentation, they're purple. Um, and so that's an important thing to understand. So are there any questions about current voltage plots right now? Okay. Um, if you have one, just unmute your mic and let me know because I'm not looking at the chat. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Okay, so this is the IV plot for an ideal voltage source. So the entire concept here is that no matter what current is being drawn from or supplied to this ideal voltage source, it will always maintain this precise voltage. So that's why it's a vertical line. So it's completely irrespective of the current, whether it's being drawn from it or being supplied to it. This does not exist, but power supplies are actually pretty close to this with one kind of caveat that they have, they'll have a current limit at which they'll be cut off. And then, um, so we're gonna look at that right now. And then I'm also just not going to include the negative side because you would never supply current to a power supply. So it's just not applicable in this case. All right. So if you imagine you took this power supply down here, you've probably seen something like it or used something like it before. And you turn the voltage dial to set the power supply voltage to 40 volts. And then you turn the current limit up to the set the current limit to one amp. Okay. You just set this up. So where we're sitting right now is right here um, at this point, which is on the voltage axis at 40 volts and no current being drawn. So zero amps of current because we haven't connected anything to our power supply yet. Now let's say we connect some load to our power supply that's um, less than 40 ohms. So at 40 ohms, right? Because V equals IR, it's gonna, 40 ohms would draw one amp. So let's say we connected 20 ohms. So it's gonna draw half an amp. We're gonna be right here on the plot. We're still at 40 volts and a half an amp is being drawn. Now, if we, um, sorry, did I say, 80 ohms. This is 80 ohms. I think I, maybe I said 20 ohms, but this is 80 ohms. Um, so that's a half an amp because it's voltage divided by resistance. Okay. If I reduce that resistance, it'll climb up this side of the plot, staying at 40 volts, but supplying more and more current and climbing up the current um, axis until it gets to one amp. And then as I reduce the um, resistance more, it's going to climb along the voltage axis down towards um, you know, towards a lower and lower voltage, but maintaining the current at one amp. So that's kind of how a power supply operates. Are there any questions about this IV plot? Okay, if you have questions, once again, just unmute your mic and let me know. Batteries, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about how they work, but basically the idea is that I want you to get out of this is that the current voltage plot for a battery doesn't have a current limit like that. So batteries, kind of have this more like dynamic range of voltages and currents that they operate at, but it's always gonna be exactly somewhere on this line. But they do have the capacity to supply a lot of current, a lot more than a current limited power supply, especially lithium ion batteries have a super high um, like instantaneous discharge capacity. And so um, that's just something that's important to think about. I'm not gonna go over why it looks exactly like this, uh, but it has to do with the internal resistance of the battery. Okay, so for an ideal diode, um, you kind of have two, there's two like main figures we're going to talk about, which is the breakdown voltage and the forward voltage. 
Now, in a second, I'm going to get into a little more detail about what those two things mean. But ideally, for a diode, between the breakdown and forward voltage, it would not conduct any current. So it's always going to stay flat on the voltage axis with no current being drawn from it or supplied um, by it or supplied to it. Um, and then once it gets to the forward voltage or the breakdown voltage, it has this completely vertical slope where it acts a lot like an ideal voltage source. Maybe you remember this looks kind of like the ideal voltage source. So no matter how much current you're going to put like pass through it um, in the forward direction or in the reverse direction, it's going to maintain a particular that exact voltage, which is the forward voltage or the exact voltage which is the breakdown voltage. So in the forward region, that's like the diode. If you make a nice schematic with the power at the top and the ground at the bottom, so things are not upside down, then your diode's pointing down, right? This arrow that's part of the diode is pointing down towards ground. That's the forward region. And so as soon as V plus gets to the forward voltage VF, um, the diode will conduct some amount of current. Um, depending on whatever the current capacity of you know, your, your voltage supply rail is. Now, if you flip the diode around and you're now in the reverse region, the operation is basically the same. But we call that the breakdown voltage. And so normally we think of diodes as like blocking current in one direction, like maybe it, al it allows current flow in this direction, but if you put it here, it would block current. And that's basically true until you get to the breakdown voltage, at which point it starts to pass you know, an infinite amount of current, however much you would have to, um, to maintain that voltage across the diode. So a real diode doesn't quite look like that. It's got some curvature to these lines. It's super steep, but not completely vertical. And so these are just some of the nuances that um, will give a more accurate picture of how the diode actually operates as we talk a little bit more about what happens when you use a Zener diode as over voltage protections. Okay, so once again, a reminder is this is how we use the Zener diode in our circuit. We have some power supply. So in this case, nine volts. Shout out to Luke, by the way, for the schematic. Um, and then we have some fuse, and then we have our Zener diode, and then the rest of our circuit is in parallel with the Zener diode. And the Zener diode is protecting all these components um, from over voltage conditions. Okay. So this is an IV plot for the actual 18 volt Zener diode we use. Once again, this is not a precise IV plot. This is like my guesstimate of roughly how the IV plot looks based on my knowledge that the forward voltage is 1.2 volts, the forward current is one amp, and the breakdown voltage is 18 volts. So I've got that represented as a negative 18 volts here. Um, one thing to note is that the maximum steady state power is five watts. That'll come back much later in this presentation, but it's something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, so what I'm gonna do with this graph right now before I put the power supply graph on top of it is I'm going to flip it upside down because our Zener diode is going to be in reverse bias. So hopefully this makes sense that all I've done, all I've done with this graph is rotated 180 degrees and then I'm just going to fix the text, but I didn't change the plot at all. So it's this exact plot rotated 180 because it's in reverse bias and then I'm going to fix the text. So hopefully that makes sense to everybody why I'm doing that. If not, it'll become apparent very soon here. So now we're going to set up our circuit to test it. We're testing with a power supply that's represented by this circle here. And we wanted our power supply to be 12 volts, 0 0.4 amp current limit. That's a great setting for testing most of our PCBs. But as happens many times, you didn't check the power supply settings before you plugged in. You're like, oh, I just used this power supply 15 minutes ago. There's no way someone changed it. So you end up accidentally supplying. 40 volts with a current limit of one amp, which is the power supply we're looking at before. And that's why we have the Zener diode here to help us protect our circuit. And so here's what happens now. So let's, let's look at what that power supply, how that power supply is gonna operate. This is just bringing back that power supply IV curve from before, and we overlaid it with the Zener diode IV curve in um, reverse bias. And so the Zener voltage, which is also the breakdown voltage in this case, is 18 volts. And so what actually happens in this circuit is it's gonna operate at the intersection of these two lines. Um, and maybe that's a little bit intuitive too when you look at the graph. Like, all, like both of these components are always gonna operate somewhere on their lines. And so for them both to be operating at the same time, they're gonna have to operate at the intersection. So that means, whoops. So that means that right here we're at one amp and 18 volts. So one amp of current is gonna flow out of the power supply. One amp is gonna flow into the Zener diode. It's gonna make this nice current loop. 
And if you put a multimeter across it, what, kind, what voltage do we think we might see? Someone can unmute and let me know what voltage you might see across this circuit. Any ideas? Forty or eighteen volts. Sorry. Eighteen volts. Yeah, that's exactly right. So this dot where these are intersecting is telling you the complete operation. So there's gonna be one amp and eighteen volts. That's gonna be true for both the power supply and for the Zener diode. It's not gonna be exactly eighteen because it's got some curvature or whatever. Like there's some stuff going on, but it'll be basically eighteen. Um, and so, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, and so. One thing is this is not exactly true because these two curves don't tell a complete picture of I think you froze, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's freezing happening. Lucky. Back. Oh, it's lucky. Lucky the fallen soldier. Someone's gonna have to take over the presentation. All right. I dominate Luke. <laughs> oh, you can probably do it, right? Yeah. Funny, funny. So, uh, can you all? All right. So, I'm just going to talk through this and hopefully Lucky reloads. If not, I'll share the presentation from my end. But looking at this graph, uh, this one amp, oh, he's gone. All right. Um, the one amp figure doesn't tell the whole story. And that's because there is some current being um, provided to the load. Um, let me pull up the presentation real quick and I can continue from there. Yeah, I can pull it up if you want. Uh, sure. Okay. Um, well, I hope y'all are doing well. Mid presentation. One second. It's in Elite, yeah? Have you guys heard about the story about the tractor? And the extractor uh, fan. <laughs> Manu, Manu, I have it. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Oh, it's in spring learning, my bad. Yeah. Um, right, your tractor story. Oh, no, no, please, no, no tractors right now. All right. No tractors. Okay. So back to where we were. We have. We have, uh, so this doesn't tell our whole story because there's more than one amp being, uh, that's needed. There's some load that the circuit is providing. So let's just pretend it's 300 milliamps in this case. Um, what that means is that since this is current limited, the amount of current flowing into the Zener diode in reverse bias is a little bit less than one amp. And if we take a look at our curve, a little bit less than one amp, uh, one amp minus 300 milliamps is 700 milliamps. So our zener diode, uh, the current flowing into it is a little bit less than one amp and that changes the voltage uh, that we're seeing. But again, it's still about 18 volts because this curve is for our intents and purposes, approximately vertical. Lucky, are you ready to take back over? Yeah, sorry, my Wi-Fi dropped. Yep, you're good. Thank you for carrying on. Yep, I'm gonna stop share. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry about that, everybody. Uh, okay, so, um, okay, so hopefully we're kind of comfortable with that concept. Um, and so, yeah, so I think we're kind of here at this point, right? So, okay, so basically we're gonna see 18 volts across circuit. It's not gonna be exactly one amp through the uh, Zener diode, um, just because of the rest of the circuit drawing some current as well. Now, the reality is, even though you set it to 40 volts, the power supply is actually going to be whatever this voltage is across here is going to be like roughly 18. Um, and you'll see that on the power supply well. It'll show you that it's apply that is applying 18 volts across your circuit um, because of the current limit. It'll bring down the voltage of the power supply. Um, cool. So alternatively, if you did this with a battery, it's basically the exact same thing. The only point I'm trying to get out, get across here is that because the battery curve looks more like this and much steeper, it might be a lot more current, but that current is not going to go through the rest of your circuit. It's just all going to get dumped through the Zener diode and the Zener diode is going to dissipate all of that um, current going through it as heat. So all the power 
um, that's being wasted here is going to become heat. And so your zener data is going to get very hot. Um, and so once again, I just, oh, shoot, I should be in present mode. I don't know why I'm not in present mode. Um, sorry, I'm a little frazzled. Um, so once again, it's not exactly going to operate at this um, intersection point uh, because of this thrustless current. And so it's going to, you know, on the zener diode, it'll be here. And for the battery, it'll still be there, but that's because of the added current um, that moves us up this current axis from the rest of the circuit. Okay. Lucky, can, yeah. I, have a, can I ask a question for the slide? Uh, yeah, the slide. So yes. what determines the split from 2.7 and the 300 milliamps? So in this case, we're assuming that whatever this rest of circuit is, at mm -hmm. this like roughly 18 volt figure just always draws 300 milliamps. So okay. for example, if you do 18 volts divided by 0.3 amps, that'll give you some resistance value. So if this was just a resistor um, of that resistance value, which is 18 divided by 0.3, I don't know what that is off the top of my head, something like 54, a little more than 54, I guess. Um, so if you have like a roughly 54 ohm resistor or something, that is an example of something that would draw 300 milliamps at this like roughly 18 volt figure. Um, so yeah, it just, so this is gonna be fixed likely, this like 300 okay. milliamps and then whatever extra current is gonna go through the Zener diode. That makes sense. Cool, and that's why you can see like in this example, right, the, the current through the rest of the circuit's the same and the Zener diode just eats whatever extra current is coming out of your supply to, mm. to limit the supply down. So in this case as well, and I forgot to add the slide, but you can imagine crossing out the 40 volts here and your battery is actually like, if you measured your battery voltage in this case, it would be 18 volts um, because the battery voltage is gonna sag a bunch um, when it's supplying this much current. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Cool. Um, so, and once again, these are just like kind of made up numbers. A 40 to 18 volt sag is pretty outrageous for a lithium ion battery and probably would be damaging to the battery in that case. But instantaneously it might, you know, maybe that actually happens, I'm not sure. All right, so Anil's laughing at me because he's right behind listening to me talk about battery. Okay, so in both of these cases, something we need to consider. So it's not enough to just know that Zener diodes regulate voltage. We have to really consider what's happening. So we know that the maximum power, constant power from before is five watts for the Zener diode. And in both of these cases, we're actually gonna be drawing a lot more, we're gonna be dissipating a lot more power than that. Because if we look at the power through the Zener diode on this side, on both sides, we're gonna have 18 volts. So power is equal to current times voltage is what this first equation is here. Hopefully that's a concept people might've seen before. And so you just multiply the current through your Zener diode by the voltage across it to get the power it's dissipating. And so you can see the voltages are the same in both cases, roughly 18 volts. And on the left here, we have the 700 milliamps. And on the right here, we have the 2.7 amps. And so that, in both cases, the power is dissipating is a lot more than the five watts that it's constantly, and Neil, can I just charge you? Um, that it's constantly rated for. And so what that means is that what's actually gonna happen is it will, it will protect your circuit for a little while until it gets too hot and the Zener diode breaks and then it's gonna stop protecting the circuit and then your circuit's gonna get ruined. And so the reality is that Zener diodes are only actually really good at doing this for a very small period of time um, which is called a transient effect. And so I know this isn't the best image, but it's just one I found online that I kind of liked. So if you have like a relatively constant V in, that's like the right value, like 12 volts in this example for our circuit. And then it just has this like random transient spike that's just like really instantaneous. The Zener dial will do a good job of what's called clamping that, of breaking, like bringing that down a lot lower than you expect, leveling it off at the value of the Zener voltage. Um, and doing that really instantaneously. So it's just a little bit of power for a little bit. The Zener diode doesn't get that much hotter. And Zener diodes can actually dissipate a lot of power for a very short amount of time. But if it's a constant situation, like we accidentally supplied the wrong voltage to our circuit, the Zener diode is gonna break. And so the way, sorry, I shouldn't have clicked ahead. The way we get around that is actually a solution that Adi came up with earlier this year, um, is that we put the fuse before the Zener diode. And so what happens now is, if this fuse is rated to something we expect for the rest of our circuit, like 300 milliamps or maybe 400 milliamps, as soon as you apply this like much higher voltage that would damage our circuit, a lot more current starts flowing because of the Zener diode, and then it'll pop the fuse, it'll create an open circuit, which then will prevent the Zener diode from becoming damaged and protect our whole circuit. So it's this kind of combination of the fuse and the Zener diode that gives us um, 
not only protection to trans protection against transient voltages, but also protection against accidentally hooking up a higher voltage than we wanted to, to our circuit. And that's something that happens all the time. I've done it on the bench many times when I'm testing a PCB, you accidentally turn the power supply up too high. Um, that's like the mo one, of the mo one of the most common um, mistakes you see on the bench. Why do we set the Zener voltage to 18 volts? Uh, well, first, first, are there any questions from this step? I know there's a lot of content on this slide um, and I know it can be pretty confusing, but um, yeah, if there are questions, I'd like to answer them now. I can check the chat too. Chat is empty. Okay. Um, yeah, feel free to unmute yourself at any time and ask questions. I'm gonna go ahead and move on from this slide. And I apologize because I know we've gone a good amount over here. Um, so another a question I wanna answer you might have is why is our Zener voltage 18 volts? And the constraints of your Zener voltage are pretty loose. Basically, it depends on two things. You don't want it to be less than your maximum supply voltage um, because then the Zener, voltage, the Zener diode would always be wasting some power as heat. So for example, if you have a 12 volt supply and your Zener diode was 10 volts, was a 10 volt Zener diode, then your supply would always be limited to 10 volts and the Zener diode would constantly be um, dissipating power that way. So you want it to be higher than your maximum supply voltage, but you want it to be lower than the maximum rating of your components because otherwise it won't protect your components. So in our case, our 12 volt supply in our car is actually not quite 12 volts. It can be kind of somewhere in the range of like somewhere between nine and 17, depending on how charged the battery is and what, what battery configuration we decide to use that year. And our buck converter is really the only thing that really needs to be protected by the Zener diode and its maximum supply voltage is 36 volts. And so 18 is somewhere in that range between 17 and 36, so we're good to go. Um, and so that's the gist of how you might pick the Zener voltage and how you might evaluate someone's choice of a Zener voltage um, when you look at their schematic. And I guess the point I wanna get across here is not enough to just think about the nominal value. Like if their schematic says 12 volts, you wanna question that. So is it exactly 12 volts? Is it ever more than 12 volts? How do you decide, is your Zener voltage high enough? Um, and you need to know what the maximum supply voltage is. Um, cool. And yeah, I guess uh, one kind of question that hopefully it will show some, demonstrate some small amount of learning from the presentation is if you can tell me in this circuit uh, whether the Zener diode is in forward or reverse bias. So you can go ahead and just fill out this really easy, not necessarily easy, but really simple poll really quick. Um, and don't feel bad if you get it wrong, it's totally fine. Um, takes a long time to get really comfortable with stuff. Okay, so far everyone has been 100% correct, which is awesome. I'll go ahead and end this poll. Um, but yeah, so that is, that is kind of a long-winded explanation of how Zener diodes provide overvoltage protection and how they can provide that protection to constant overvoltage if you put them in series with a fuse, um, like, like, like Luke's schematic is here. So actually, if you look at a lot of our schematics from this year, the fuse is on the other side of the Zener diode because that's how we used to do it. And that was a mistake. And that was a good catch that Audie made this year when he was, you know, kind of going through some of the electrical design checklists. And so you kind of want to be reevaluating these checks all the time. Um, and yeah, uh, cool. Are there questions here? This is the feedback link. Um, if you want to get feedback on the presentation, I'm sorry, the Wi-Fi dropped. And I got a little bit kind of frazzled afterwards. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to answer questions right now. Um, this is the feedback link. I'll also put it in the chat. Um, but I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen so we can look at each other. And then, um, yeah, if there are questions, I can just go ahead and answer them now. <laughs>